it was not accidental. It was a carefully contrived occurrence. The international bankers sought to bring about a condition of despair here so that they might emerge as rulers of us all. But McFadden went even farther. He openly accused them of causing the crash in order to steal America's gold. In February 1931, in the midst of the Depression, he put it this way. I think it can hardly be disputed that the statesmen and financiers of Europe are ready to take almost any means to reacquire rapidly the gold stock which Europe lost to America as the result of World War I. Curtis Dahl, a broker for Lehman Brothers, was on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange the day of the crash. In his 1970 book, FDR, My Exploited Father-in-Law, he explained that the crash was triggered by the planned sudden shortage of call money in the New York money market. Actually, it was the calculated shearing of the public by the world money powers triggered by the planned sudden shortage of call money in the New York money market. Within a few weeks, $3 billion of wealth simply seemed to vanish. Within a year, $40 billion had been lost. But did it really disappear? Or was it simply consolidated in fewer hands? And what did the Federal Reserve do? Instead of moving to help the economy out by quickly lowering interest rates to stimulate the economy, the Fed continued to brutally contract the money supply further, deepening the Depression. Between 1929 and 1933, the Fed reduced the money supply by an additional 33%. Although most Americans have never heard that the Fed was the cause of the Depression, this is well known among top economists. Milton Friedman, the Nobel Prize winning economist now of Stanford University, said the same thing in a national public radio interview in January of 1996. The Federal Reserve definitely caused the Great Depression by contracting the amount of currency in circulation by one third from 1929 to 1933. But the money lost by most Americans during the Depression didn't just vanish. It was just redistributed into the hands of those who had gotten out just before the crash and had purchased gold, which is always a safe place to put your money just before a depression. But America's money also went overseas. Incredibly, as President Hoover was heroically trying to rescue banks and prop up businesses, with millions of Americans starving as the Great Depression deepened, millions of dollars were being spent rebuilding Germany from damage sustained during World War I. Eight years before Hitler would invade Poland, Representative Louis McFadden, chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee, warned Congress that Americans were paying for Hitler's rise to power. After World War I, Germany fell into the hands of the German international bankers. Those bankers bought her, and they now own her lock, stock, and barrel. They have purchased her industries, they have mortgages on her soil, they control her production, they control all her public utilities. The international German bankers have subsidized the present government of Germany and they have also supplied every dollar of the money Adolf Hitler has used in his lavish campaign to build up a threat to the government of Brüning. When Brüning fails to obey the orders of the German international bankers, Hitler is brought forth to scare the Germans into submission. Through the Federal Reserve Board, over 30 billions of dollars of American money has been pumped into Germany. You have all heard of the spending that's taken place in Germany. Modernistic dwellings, her great planetariums, her gymnasiums, her swimming pools, her fine public highways, her perfect factories. All this was done on our money. All this was given to Germany through the Federal Reserve Board. The Federal Reserve Board has pumped so many billions of dollars into Germany that they dare not name the total. Franklin D. Roosevelt was swept into office during the 1932 presidential election. 
Once Roosevelt was in office, however, sweeping emergency banking measures were immediately announced, which did nothing but increase the Fed's power over the money supply. Then, and only then, did the Fed finally begin to loosen the purse strings and feed new money out to the starving American people. At first, Roosevelt railed against the money changers as being the cause of the Depression. Believe it or not, this is what he said on March 4, 1933, in his inaugural address. Practices of the unscrupulous money changers stand indicted in the court of public opinion, rejected by the hearts and minds of men. The money changers have fled from their high seats in the temple of our civilization. But two days later, Roosevelt declared a bank holiday and closed all banks. Later that year, Roosevelt outlawed private ownership of all gold bullion and all gold coins with the exception of rare coins. Most of the gold in the hands of the average American was in the form of gold coins. The new decree was, in effect, a confiscation. Those who didn't comply risk as much as 10 years in prison and a $10,000 fine, the equivalent of $100,000 today. Out in small town America, some people didn't trust Roosevelt's order. Many were torn between keeping their hard-earned wealth or obeying the government. Those who did turn in their gold were paid the official price for it, $20.66 per ounce. So unpopular was the confiscation order that no one anywhere in government would take credit for authoring it. No congressman claimed it. At the signing ceremony, President Roosevelt made it clear to all present that he was not the author of it and publicly stated that he had not ever read it. Even his Secretary of the Treasury said he'd never read it either, saying it was, quote, what the experts wanted. Roosevelt convinced the public to give up their gold by saying that pooling the nation's resources was necessary to get America out of the Depression. With great fanfare, he ordered a new bullion depository built to hold the mountain of gold the U.S. government was illegally confiscating. By 1936, the U.S. bullion depository at Fort Knox was completed, and in January 1937, the gold began to flow into it. The ripoff of the ages was about to proceed. In 1935, once the gold had all been turned in, the official price of gold was suddenly raised to $35 per ounce. But the catch was only foreigners could sell their gold at the new higher price. The money changers who had heeded Warburg's note and gotten out of the stock market just before the crash and bought gold at $20.66 per ounce, then shipped it to London, could now bring it back and sell it back to the government, nearly doubling their money while the average American starved. The Fort Knox Bullion Depository sits here in the middle of the Fort Knox Military Reservation, 30 miles southwest of Louisville, Kentucky. This was as close as we were permitted to get to the depository despite years of letters from members of Congress to allow our film crew inside. The four-acre grounds immediately surrounding the building are guarded by an electrified steel fence, an open moat, and four machine-gun-armed guard pillboxes at the structure's corners. When the gold began arriving on January 13, 1937, there was unprecedented security. Thousands of official guests watched the arrival of a nine-car train from Philadelphia, guarded by armed soldiers, postal inspectors, secret servicemen, and guards from the U.S. Mint. It was all great theater. America's gold supply from across the land had been pooled, supposedly for the public benefit, and then safely tucked into Fort Knox. But all that security would soon be breached by the government itself. Now the stage was set for a really big war, one which would pile up debt far beyond that of World War I.